Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with Lord Have Mercy, page 156. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We join in the Glory Be to God, page 157. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We praise you, we bless you, we worship you. We glorify you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You take away the sin of the world. Receive our prayer. You sit at the right hand of God the Father. Have mercy on us. For you only are holy. You only are the Lord. You only, O Christ, with the Holy Spirit, are most high. 
delight in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to know you is to have everlasting life. Grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may boldly confess him to be the Christ and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for this morning's reading. I invite you to follow along on your bulletin inserts as we take in the portions of God's Word for this 14th Sunday after Pentecost. Our first reading is taken from the book of Joshua. We read chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, verses 14 through 18. The Lord had called Joshua to, to succeed Moses as the leader of his people, to lead them into the Promised Land to give them victory after victory until the land was theirs. Now, before the people depart and go back to their home territories to settle the land and to live there, he calls upon them to renew the commitment to the Lord that they had made uh, early at, in their time in the land. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, and he summoned the elders of Israel, its heads, its judges, and its officers, and they presented themselves before God. Then Joshua told all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has said. From ancient times, your ancestors, including Terah, who was the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they served other gods. Joshua said, Now therefore, Fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly and faithfully. Remove the gods that your fathers served in the region across the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if you see no benefit in serving the Lord, then choose for yourselves today whomever you will serve, whether the gods that your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord." The people responded by saying, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord in order to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he is the one who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt where we were slaves. He is the one who performed these great signs right before our eyes and protected us on the whole journey that we made and among all the peoples through whom we passed. The Lord drove out of our presence all the peoples and the Amorites who were living in the land. We too will serve the Lord, because he is our God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would turn toward the front of your hymnal to Psalm 119, we will be using uh, section D for the verses. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statues. 
teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, Therefore I hate every wrong path. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. Our second reading is taken from the letter to the Hebrews. We read chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. This is that section in the letter where heroes of faith are being held up for the, for the readers to learn from. By faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter when he grew up. He chose to be mistreated with God's people rather than enjoy sin for a little while. He considered disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt without fearing the king's wrath, because he persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith he celebrated the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not strike them down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for this morning's gospel acclamation. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Praise God for a living hope. Christ is risen from the dead. We hear the gospel according to St. John chapter 6, verses 51 through 69, which also serves as our sermon text for this morning. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. At that, the Jews argued among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Amen. Amen, I tell you. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven not like your fathers ate and died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. When they heard it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, asked them, does this cause you to stumble in your faith? What if you would see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? The Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh does not help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe and the one who would betray him. He said, 
this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is given to him by my Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus asked the twelve, You do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated. We continue with the singing of our hymn of the day, hymn 638, The Gospel Shows the Father's Grace. Grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned, our text for this morning is taken from the Gospel of John. I again read an introductory verse. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our sight 
of our hearts now be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there are teachings that we hear as we're growing up that are kind of hard to deal with, hard to accept. You're sitting in history class, and the subject for the day is the Holocaust. And you think to yourself, well, there's no way anybody can be so, so inhumane as to treat fellow man like this. And so there are a lot of people who don't think it really happened. Or if you're taking a look at medicine, there are many people who would love to be a veterinarian or they would love to be a doctor. They have a heart for animals or they have a heart for people. And then in their training, they observe the operations and they see what is actually done to the patients to cure their ill or to correct uh, the results of an accident. And, and many of them say, no, 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 that's not for me. Even in marriage, a dewy-eyed couple pledges themselves to one another and it's happily ever after until the first big fight over who knows what. And one of them has to confess their sin to the other and the other needs to hear that confession and request for forgiveness and practice the ministry of the keys and forgive. These are, these are hard truths or hard facts to deal with, to accept. In Jesus' message today, he is dealing with a hard fact. Remember how John the Baptist introduced Jesus to those of his disciples and anyone who was listening the day that Jesus passed by, the day after he was baptized in the River Jordan, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was a symbolic statement, wasn't it? Jesus didn't go, bah, as he walked by. He didn't have wool. He wasn't on four legs. He was walking by on two feet wearing a set of clothing. The Lamb of God. What was that to tell the people? The Jewish people had been steeped in sacrifice, in worship. And that lamb, from the time of the original Passover, was to symbolize the payment for sins in blood. The children of Israel were told to smear it on the doorposts and the lintel of their homes the evening that the angel of death was going to come. And those who believed and practiced that, the angel of death would pass over their homes. When the Lord brought them out of Egypt and instituted the rules and the regulations, the, the ceremonial laws, how they were to worship him, part and parcel of that was to offer up a lamb for sacrifice. There were regular sacrifices made throughout the year, but on the great day of atonement, one lamb was to be sacrificed for the sins of all the people. And that shed blood was going to cover the sins so that God would see them no longer. Symbolism. John used it. Jesus certainly used it in his ministry, as he's doing here. The group that followed him after the feeding of the 5,000 started it. He miraculously fed them from the two small preserved fish and the five little biscuits of bread that this one boy in the crowd had brought along with him fed over 5,000 people. And they came after him, hoping that he would continue to give them free food. They wanted a bread king. So Jesus used that symbol to speak to them, to call them to himself. Bread was a common feature of the Jewish faith and of the Jewish life. Bread was a staple for them. 
bread was also there in the temple. There was a loaf of showbread for each of the 12 tribes continuously before the Lord, representing them and, and reminding them of his care for their needs. And he speaks to them, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. That symbolism. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then from that idea of, of manna, which God miraculously gave the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years to that miracle of feeding the 5,000 plus with, the, with that small amount of food. We are told in the verses preceding our text the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is not leaving this group in the dark about things. He's making the connection. This is what that symbolic word bread stands for. It stands for me. The Father sent me to pay for sin. The Father sent me to earn holiness for you. The Father sent me to save. And so he repeats this, this term over and over again. And he's evermore bringing it into sharper focus for the people. Just like you, you nature lovers might be watching a bird and you pull up the binoculars for the first time and it's pretty fuzzy. But you turn the dial and you can dial it in until you can see the veins on the feathers. Jesus, in this discussion, is gradually adjusting the focus so that they can see exactly what he's talking about. Is that going to help? Jesus said, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. At that, the Jews argued among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were struggling getting past that idea of we want literal bread for our stomachs and he's offering us symbolic bread for our souls. And then he speaks symbolically of the flesh. You and I understand as we read through the Gospels what he's referring to, don't we? It was Jesus' flesh that took the blows for us. It was Jesus' flesh that was pierced by the thorns. It was Jesus' flesh that allowed the nails to penetrate and hang him on the tree. It was his flesh that was punished for our sins, not ours. And when he goes on to talk about his blood, them drinking his blood, we remember how his blood flowed from the cross. He gave up his lifeblood for the sins of the world. We know what he's speaking about, but they're stuck on literal. And so they, they are thinking about him the same thing that some people during the Reformation era accused, accused the Lutherans of, being flesh pressers, which, which means meat eaters. And they were insinuating that the Lutherans who believed in the real presence of the Lord's body and blood in the Lord's Supper were cannibals and were secretly having terrible meals. That is what is going through the minds of these Jews. He can't really be saying this, can he? Jesus further tightens the focus. So Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, go back to that original explanation in verse 32. For the bread of God is the one, the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Is Jesus literally talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood? No. He is talking about believing in him and trusting in his saving work to be our solution to that problem of sin. 
He says, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like your fathers ate and died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. You notice that there are, there are several statements that are repeated through this exchange. That truth that the bread of God is the one who came down from heaven. Jesus Christ as he took on flesh in the Virgin Mary's womb. That he will die for the sins of the world. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life and that on the last day he will raise that person up. Everyone who believes in him. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When they heard it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can listen to it? When you hear that statement, does the thought come to mind, with, oh, they still don't get it. They don't understand. Is that their problem? It's not that they don't understand. They got it. They understand now exactly what he's saying. But they don't like it. They don't like it. It's a hard teaching. Why is it such a hard teaching? Well, it's a hard teaching because we don't want to believe that we're sinners who need a Savior. It's a hard teaching to think that our sin is so serious that throwing a few coins in the offering at the temple I won't cover it. That, that buying a lamb and, and bringing it to the priest to slaughter and him offering it up on the altar won't cover it. It's a hard teaching because there's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God through our efforts. No matter what we try to abstain from, no matter what we try to practice, we can't make ourselves right with God. Jesus had to come down to do it for us. And that makes it a hard teaching. There are many people today that hear the gospel and, and they can have it explained to them and explained to them until they understand perfectly what is being said and still walk away. This is a hard teaching because they can't bring themselves to recognize what they are as sinful human beings in this world, how serious their situation is, and how there is only one solution to their problem, and that is the Christ. Jesus, uh, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, asked them, does, does this cause you to stumble in your faith? In the Christian church, there have been teachings that have caused people to stumble in their faith. Uh, there are divisions in the Christian church, aren't there? There were divisions over the idea of infant baptism. Can simple washing with water and God's word really bring a person to faith? Really? Wash away that child's sins and plant saving faith. Make them adopted child of God. Can the Lord's Supper really have Jesus' true body and blood in a miraculous way given to us in, with, and under the bread and wine for the real forgiveness of sins? Or are they just symbolic? We look at the Lord's teachings on creation and hear what science says. Can the word really be true in that area? And if it's not, then there is no sin and there's no need for a savior. We hear the Lord speak on the gift of sexuality in marriage and, and the Lord points out that sexuality is to be expressed only within the bounds of a husband and a wife, a man and a woman who have committed themselves to one another in marriage. And people can understand these things and yet say this is a hard teaching. 
and, and, and fall back from it and make, it, make them stumble in their faith. Jesus points out it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh does not help at all. You notice that in every one of these instances where someone is struggling with faith, they're struggling because their human reason is tripping them up. Their logic is getting in the way. Sin and grace is not logical according to human logic, is it? But it is perfect in God's love and God's grace being expressed toward us. Jesus says, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you who do not believe. And Jesus knew from the beginning those who were going to trust in him and those who were not going to believe, even, even that one hypocrite, Judas, who was going to betray him. And then he speaks to the twelve, and he asked them the question when, when many of the disciples turned away and quit following him. You're not going to leave me too, are you? You notice he's, he's expecting that they're going to stay, but he's allowing them to make the statement for themselves. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Good answer. <laughs> An answer given by the Spirit wrought faith that Peter and the disciples had. There are hard teachings that confront us in life. Do we allow them to sidetrack us, to derail us in our walk with our Lord, with our life of faith? Or do we recognize that God's word is inspired by the Holy Spirit and as the Lord Jesus himself testifies that, that his word is truth? Do we recognize that where God speaks on an issue, he speaks truly? And if there's a problem understanding it, it's our sinful human nature or the sinful view of the world around us that is, is the problem. God calls us to walk with him by faith. And as the Holy Spirit works through the word, he brings us to that recognition that God's word is true, both in the law which condemns us and in the gospel which calls us to trust in Jesus and have life in his name. And we accept those hard teachings and we trust our Lord and Savior who has provided the only option for us to salvation, that bread that came down from heaven, Jesus Christ our Lord. Pray that you cling to him with all the strength that the Spirit gives you, come what may. Amen. Please rise. We join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed as found on page 162 in your hymnals. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We continue with the prayer of the church, page 164. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, whom, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially this morning, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with Lori Clements during her time of struggle with MS. We pray that you would ease her pain, that you would comfort her with the knowledge that you are with her, that your promise of salvation is sure. Remember those who suffer persecution for their faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Please rise. We continue with the sacrament, page 165. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord. thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Oh. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the Messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, Take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your Congregation may be seated. Those prepared to commune will be ushered forward. Our distribution hymn for today is hymn 661, Draw Near and Take the Body of Your Lord.
to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We join in the singing of our closing hymn, hymn 929, May the Peace of God. Good morning. Good morning. Glad you could be with us this morning. Um, we've got the, a note. I'm sure uh, everybody's been planning this. Catechism class will begin on Wednesday, September 11th at 4 p.m. After speaking with uh, some of the parents, uh, class location will be at St. Paul's Morris this year as there is a larger number of students that will be coming from Trinity Mount Olive next year and then we'll have, we'll have class out here the next year. Um, got the note for the Trinity Mount Olive members 
with the mission offering that's being collected for LWMS, take that under your consideration. And the note that there will be no women's Bible study on Monday, September 2nd, Labor Day. We do have on September 8th the, the joint service here, and uh, St. Paul's is going to be sponsoring, uh, sponsoring it and uh, be providing the, the meat and so on for the meal like, like last year. Uh, you were invited to bring uh, side dishes, desserts to pass. Um, we, we hope to have good turnout again this year like we did last and build on that. God bless your day and your week. Thank you.